Hey everybody, welcome back to The Combat Chain. I'm your host, Adam Filipchuk, now joined by Sean Hill. And uh, we've got an exciting uh, new episode for you guys. We're joined here today with uh, our uh, special guest, uh, Charles Dunn, uh, also known as at Tinman354 on uh, on Twitter. And uh, if you were watching the, the Calling Indianapolis uh, footage this weekend, you definitely know who he is. Uh, but first off, how's it going, guys? I'm good, going great. You know, just came off a, a good result, the calling. So uh, feeling pretty good. Yeah, you absolutely killed it, man. You had a great absolutely. run. Your weekend yeah. was beautiful. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was great. So, Charles, um, you know, you killed it this weekend. And uh, w- what's interesting about this is like we met earlier. I think we, we met in passing in uh, New Jersey. And, uh, you know, Pat was playing and we kind of I, I met you through uh, Julian, who's a, a friend of mine. And uh, and I didn't know who you were. And I think like a lot of players, you know, in fab, they didn't you know, you, you've had success, but they didn't really know who you were up until this weekend where they're like, hey, he's playing the world champion. Who is this guy mm-hmm. and what's this deck he's on and what's his story? I'd like to give everybody like a chance to kind of know a bit more about you. Uh, if you could take a couple minutes, like, who are you? What do you do? Who is Charles Dunn? Yeah, so uh, well, I'm Charles Dunn, and uh, I've been playing uh, card games or just like competitive games my entire life. You know, I think I started playing card games when I was like five years old, and my parents taught me to play the Pokemon TCG whenever that came out. Um, and so I, you know, I went through all kinds of different card games. Um, uh, the one I played probably the most competitively before Flesh and Blood uh, was the World of Warcraft trading card game. Uh, played that a lot through high school and into college. Uh, before that, um, that game kind of uh, got canceled, and then uh, other games like Hearthstone and Magic, uh, I started picking up those a whole lot. And so really, I've just been a competitive card gamer my entire life. Um, I have a background like um, outside of card games in uh, biomedical engineering. Uh, that's what my uh, degree is in. But uh, I worked in that medical field for a few years, decided it kind of wasn't for me, and uh, eventually ended up getting a job working as a game designer at Blizzard, which is where I currently work. Um, well, remote, remotely work for Blizzard. Um, I work on the Diablo 4 team as a class designer, so that's my day job. And uh, all, pretty much all my spare time is spent uh, playing Flesh and Blood or playing other video games and, uh, you know, just kind of living a good life. Very cool. I, I, you know what? Uh, it's cool that you're mentioning World the World of Warcraft TCG because um, you were, you know, we were talking earlier, and and you 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 were very young when you were playing WoW TCG competitively. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, like I said, mostly during high school. Like I was 14, 15, traveling to tournaments, which um, my parents at the time were kind of like, oh, I don't know about this, but <laughs> I'd been doing it so much that I had a great group of friends that I'd travel with, and uh, yeah, so that I've been I've been doing that for quite a while, and. Uh, you know, maybe I wasn't the best player back then, you know, but I, I've learned and grown and uh, that experience carries through and uh, it's transferring well into Flesh and Blood today. Well, you definitely have chops, man, because, um, you know, when when I look at, at how you perform this weekend and, you know, and, and some people like we'll get into it later with like the kind of deck you played, but like your plays, you're so focused, you're so honed in uh, and you're a very disciplined guy, like uh, for, you know. Mm-hmm. Those who don't know you, you're like a very, you know, you, you, the way you live your life is very structured and like you're very hard on yourself uh, in a good way. Um, and you have a Discipline, really strong background. Yeah, this yeah. discipline. Yeah, sorry. I'm hard on myself. You're disciplined. <laughs> uh, and uh, looking at like, you know, your 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 success that you had, that's not new, though. You, you've mm-hmm. been successful at FAB for a oh, while. Yeah. Like, what are your achievements? Yeah, it's pretty much since, since uh, well, my very first uh, tournament of Flesh and Blood, I, I had no idea about the game. My friend uh, Pat Eschke was saying, hey, you should try out this new card game. And um, our history, like me and Pat have been friends forever, but he, he's been known to like, hey, you should try this card game to me a whole lot. And so this one, I just I'm like, eh, we'll see. Um, but this is like kind of um, a, right around the Tales of Aria release. So uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, and I... I was initially a little skeptical, but he's like, well, there's this big tournament, The Calling in Cincinnati, um, and I'm from Pittsburgh, so it's not that far away. Um, he said, let's go out there and play, and that was the first time I touched physical Flesh and Blood cards. Um, didn't do too well in the main event, as you would probably expect as <laughs> first time playing, 
Um, but I was pretty much instantly hooked. And so uh, that, uh, that, that fall and into the winter, I was playing a bunch um, online on Tabletop Simulator and, and at our local armories and whatnot. Um, and so my first kind of real event that I went to was the Battle Hardened in, or the very first Battle Hardened in Philadelphia. And uh, that's where uh, Everfest just came out. And so we had the Starvo deck because Starvo was insane. And uh, I won the whole thing. So got first place at my first Battle Hardened. Um, so that was a great start <laughs> to my like, kind of real competitive <laughs> flesh and blood career. Um, after that, um, played in another Battle Hardened in Pittsburgh in my hometown with Starvo again and got first place there. So uh, already racked up two Battle Hardened wins before even uh, going to the first Pro Tour. Um, one of the Pro Tour in Jersey and the Pro Tour in Lil did decently enough. I, I came out of both of those with a winning record, uh, getting to day two on both of them, uh, but didn't really place too terribly highly. I honestly don't remember the exact uh, position, but it was a winning record. It was fine. Um, and uh, then played in a handful of other battle, battle hardens, got top four in Columbus, uh, or sorry, top eight in Colum Columbus, and then top four at, at Lil. Yeah, you knocked um, me out of the. Uh, I think you know you're the one who took a win away from me. I finished like 11th in Lil or yes. something like that. <laughs> yeah, I I went six and zero in that Swiss, and I lost to Chris Ayali in the top four, who then lost to Michael Hamilton in the finals, which was really funny because the the finals of that battle harden was actually the finals of Worlds a few months later. Um, Hamilton <laughs> yeah, and Ayali. So um, funny how that works. Uh, but I got I got top four there. Um, and then played at Worlds, did okay again um just kind of had a winning record didn't you know get as high as i would have liked um but kind of over the past over the, since worlds i kind of went back to you know back to the grindstone kind of like figure out why am i not you know really performing at these high level events and um i think i've you know overcome that and and put together a really good result here at the calling uh last weekend getting second place um losing to hamilton because you know a lot of people lose to michael hamilton <laughs> <laughs> Of course, but um, I, I think you know your run is so commendable, and and the deck choice and all that. And uh, mm -hmm. before we get, I'll I'll let Adam ask you about uh, your deck choice going into Indianapolis. But I have one last question, and this is uh, I'm a I'm a hobbyist game designer, uh, as I've probably busted your ears mm -hmm. with a couple times. Um, and I kind of wanted to ask you, like I know why I like Flesh and Blood. I'm all about the game design. I think that's a beautiful game. But why are you playing Flesh and Blood above anything else? You definitely you know have experience with a lot of card games. Why Flesh and Blood? Uh, it's, it's just the game that I feel like, I feel like I can play and, and have agency and my decisions matter, uh, the most, you know, I, I played tons of magic, um, and just the number of games where you'd be like, oh, you know, I didn't draw my third land or, um, yeah. or just like, okay, I'm top decking, oh, they drew the one perfect answer and then it's game over. Um, the amount of games that just kind of came down to that was like. I, I once I played Flesh and Blood, I realized like, oh, there's another way of doing card games, and another way that that makes you feel like the games are always close. Like even even games that you like feel really in control of, both players are generally single digit to single digit life totals. Like the games feel close, they feel engaging, and and that's just like very um, compelling to come back to over and over again. You just want to play those close uh, games where your decisions matter. Absolutely. That's that's such a cool thing for you to say, because I, I, I feel the same way. Like, there is nothing worse than a game that is uh, win more or lose more kind of thing. Like, Flesh and Blood, there is an exchange. There's a, And there is a clear difference between playing it in person and playing it online. Like, I never get the same kind of feeling on Talishar that I would playing against you, uh, because you, not only because you are, you know, very, very skilled, uh, but there's an exchange there. There's a tension that is, is only experience you can only experience in person right yeah um so i'll let adam get into uh, the rest of the stuff but those were amazing answers thank you so much all right charles so for the next question let's let's set the stage a bit we're going to talk about your deck mm -hmm. choice and yeah. i think we start off by looking at uh the most recent band and suspended announcement uh there were some key changes there one of them being oldham losing uh losing his winter's whale a uh four damage with a conditional on hit it was uh definitely a huge uh a few huge, huge factor in the meta and uh coming out of that loss there was a lot of discussion about what the future of oldham would be you started hearing about these abominations as as i heard some people refer to it on uh talishar of this 
what I think, like, I don't know if it's the, the, the term has been coined yet. I'm going to try to coin it as like cleric fatigue old him, um, where maybe the entire goal isn't entirely fatigue, but it's attrition and it's surviving every, every threat your, your opponent has to throw at you. Um, and, uh, moving into, moving into Indianapolis, you showed that there is a version of the deck that can do incredibly well and has an answer to probably everything that can, can be thrown at it, you know, taking, you were undefeated up until the final. So, you know, what mm-hmm. What were the initial decisions towards your deck and what made your deck successful, uh, especially when people were anticipating fatigue, were anticipating that life gain and were bringing tech to try to overcome it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, fatigue is a very... Uh... It's a very interesting strategy, and, and it's like you said, it's not so much that I'm trying to run you completely out of cards, uh, although a lot of matches do end up coming down to that. It's more about just surviving the onslaught um, of your opponent. And the way I kind of pitched the deck in my mind the first time was like, um, the first cycle of your deck, if, it's, if it has 60 cards in it, lasts 15 turns, right? Because it's four cards per turn, 60 cards. And if you can just survive that first cycle, from front. Like, don't worry about dealing damage to them. Just survive. Just have your life total be greater than zero. At the end of 15 turns, your opponent's deck probably stinks now. It's probably just <laughs> full of blues that they pitched first cycle. Um, and so if you can get to that point and you're alive, Ultim just has the defensive tools between Rampart, Crown of Seeds, Earth React, um, to just, like, you know, not leak any points in that endgame. Like, you're not going to spend two cards blocking a four because you have these, these breakpoint blockers. Um, and so I kind of figured if I just like, don't worry about ever attacking you first cycle, like if you can just survive to that point, like you just auto win the game because your opponent's deck is just full of blues and your deck is just better at that point. And so that was kind of the conceptual basis, uh, for the deck and, uh, why you see so many things like the life gain cards, not because they trade with a card out of your opponent's deck, like a traditional fatigue deck might want to, you know, oh, I would just want to trade for your card. It's just about surviving, getting to the point where my deck is... Is, is of a higher quality than your deck. At the start of the game, your deck is higher quality because you have high impact reds. But by second cycle, you probably don't have many of those left. That's really interesting. I, and I wanted to uh, add one little thing. I think the right name for that deck would be Paladin, but I'm not sure if that's... <laughs> oh, that's, that's actually... Paladin. Yeah, yeah Paladin. Paladin like Olden. <laughs> Paladin Olden. That's yeah, a Paladin, yeah. yeah. Paladin, perfect. Uh, Paladin. I, I wanna, and uh, sorry, Adam, I might I might steal your, your next question here, but... Um, so here's here's something that is um it's an unfortunate thing to confront but do you think that um obviously fatigue is a great strategy and it did well for you uh, i've played fatigue decks before i played fatigue prism into uh, jersey um there's an argument that fatigue is not is not good for the game or that it's 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 not fun or it's not a, a like what do you think about that do you think fatigue is bad for flesh and blood or do you think it's just something that is there and people need to deal with yeah, so I've got uh, a couple of pretty hot takes on this, and I'm probably going to make some people mad with what I'm going to say. So, you know, I'm going to say it. Um, I think people uh, build bad decks um, that if they can't deal with fatigue, um, and I think people don't like want to block when they should be blocking. Because <laughs> um, a, a lot of games, like, a, a lot of Flesh and Blood players think, okay, well, this card I can attack for four with it, or I could block for three with it. Um, so they're going to just like, well, I should attack for four, but and then they take damage on the back end uh, to do that. Um, and and that's the, the kind of Flesh and Blood that everyone really likes. They they like playing like, <laughs> oh, I just want to play my cards. I want to get my value. I want to be done with it. Um, and then the game ends in you know four turns. It's just who did the most damage in those four turns because no one wanted to block. Um, they, they're not thinking about that longer game about like, well, if I block three now, does my deck get better or worse compared to my opponents? Um, and, and so I think that kind of shift in mentality around like, don't, don't take damage unnecessarily, um, is, is a very different mindset than I think a lot of people were taught flesh and blood and kind of fell in love with it. And so I'm kind of sympathetic in that way. Like, Hey, this is the kind of game you like, you like, you know, looking at the value that my hand can do versus your hand and then just 
you know, run the math and do the highest value play that for the here and now. Um, but fatigue kind of forces those players to think about longer term, which many players, when they built their deck or when they, they think about playing Flesh and Blood, they don't think about how does my deck perform on turn 25? They think about how does it, how does it perform now <laughs> um, on this turn? Um, and so fatigue is, it will rub people the wrong way because it, it forces them out of their comfort zone. Um, but as the fatigue player, that's really good because that's my comfort zone. That's why I built the deck and I'm used to it and I'm ready to think that way. Um, and, and if you aren't, then I think, you know, like that's, that's a level of, or, or that's something that high level flesh and blood players need to, um, kind of reckon with in order to continue playing at a higher level. That is, um, you said you had a hot take. I don't think that's a hot take. <laughs> you don't I, think think so. very, I think that's a very <laughs> reasonable take. I, and I think I think telling important... people that they're building bad decks and playing poorly is is gonna <laughs> is gonna no, be a hot I don't, take. I don't think I don't so know. at all. I, I don't think so at all. I think there's an important distinction there because I've engaged in this conversation in a lot of different levels in a lot of different ways. And mm. right off the bat, one important distinction is the di the difference between kitchen table play and high level professional play and what people want out of that. And at the kitchen table level, I can a hundred percent appreciate like going to your armory and just facing fatigue all the time. I don't that can be armories. Yeah. Don't no, I, I'm not, I'm not accusing you I wouldn't you subject of that. my locals to this. <laughs> no, <laughs> <wouldn't> absolutely. Do <laughs> absolutely. And I'm not, I'm not accusing you of that, but I think when, when some people talk about like the, the fun of, of playing the game and talk about, um talk about the play patterns of fatigue and how it's an un unfun play experience absolutely it, in armories and below it is i i think it is probably actually one of the worst thing for the games be, for the game because if fatigue becomes and not to say that you're i don't think your use of fatigue was was a malicious use of it i think if where my concern is with fatigue is if it ever reaches a point where it is just the undeniable best way to win a game across the board, like there's no strategy that can contend with it. That is a bad look for the game. And there, I think they're not saying it's there, not saying we're going there, but it, there's, there's always that fear that fatigue people could look to fatigue if they're just looking for an undeniable way to try to win the game. And to Charles' point, we have ways to to challenge fatigue right now. Though losing belittle doesn't help, there still is ways. I think a lot of good ways to challenge fatigue at this point. I don't think we're there yet. And at the kitchen table level, uh, yeah, we don't we don't want that. But at the pro level, then, uh, sorry, Sean, I'm almost done. At, at the it's pro cool. level, I have this like little thing. <laughs> yeah, at the pro level, to your point, Charles, if you want to play with the big boys. You have to be able to play the game it was meant, the way it was meant to be played, and to find your place to to get every little advantage you can. And to that point, if in a healthy meta, you found a way to, to Charles found a way to do it well, attrition that is that is exploiting the meta, and that is that is okay, and that is you yeah you did it well go ahead sean <laughs> you're just playing the game you know uh we wanted to get into the whole fatigue conversation a little bit later um and but one of the things that i wanted to do and i i know that there's a few guys that are watching this right now out of ontario canada who are laughing because there's this one player called michael walker who was in the top eight of the canadian nats on the fatigue dash list that uh i can't remember his name jacob something jacob ba ended up playing uh so He's the kind of guy that will bring that deck to every armory he goes to. Oh, uh, and, no. And he, did, and he did win two pro quests on Fatigue Oldham. Yeah. Uh, so just a little, you know, thing there. But I like the idea of, you know, there's a different mentality. And I think I try to do that as well. You don't have the same mentality when you show up to an armory than when you show up to a calling. It's a different right. environment. It's a different way to play the game. And um, as, like, as far as talking to yourself also, because you're someone who's very disciplined and i think that you probably have a, a state of mind that is very different when you're pre you're preparing for a big event than when you are preparing for you know uh more of a casual setting and what's that like for you and this is like uh this was not in our plans but this is something i'm really interested in is <laughs> what's the mental preparation that goes into playing 50 to 55 minute games all day for two days how oh, do yeah. you prepare for that 
Yeah, it was kind of rough uh, for the tournament. Like uh, my rounds at at Indy um, <laughs> were were often like cl- close to time. I mean, I didn't. I only went to actual time on the clock uh, a few times, uh, most of the time. But you know, still had five or ten minutes left. But it was still. Um, it was still pretty mentally taxing. So like th- there was a level of preparation. I played um, a good number of games on, on Talishar just to like, really know the deck and its lines inside and out, like know exactly the break points for blocking so that, you know, I could, I could go through it and play my half of the match very quickly. Uh, and with as little kind of uh, mental effort as possible, like just being able to, you know, throw my cards down to block in the right order as quickly as possible. Um, and so actually like, even though my games went pretty long, the amount of time where I had to consciously make like a tough decision or like kind of be in the tank um, was not very much. Uh, more of the onus was on my opponents to play quickly um, and because my turns were often just block four times or block three times an arsenal or, um, you know, at most I'm like, you know, swinging a hammer or playing a healing bomb on my turn. Um, so honestly, I, I kind of came out of both the days of the, the event not feeling as mentally taxed as you might expect from a 55 minute game. Although I bet most of my opponents would say exactly the opposite. <laughs> That's so interesting. I, I got to know. Um, Cause I, I have a hot take here, actually. We're going to yeah. go a little off topic. And there, there's this idea that I, I'm starting to form that Talishar is becoming an unpleasant place to play games. And I'm curious what your experience was playing that monstrosity of a deck on Talishar. <laughs> uh, there was one game uh, I was playing against Phi uh, pre the little ban, and and I knew the five matchup. You can lose it, but like if you play tight and you play play well, um, it's pretty favored for Ultim. And about like five turns in, um, my opponent says, "If you're gonna be on the full fatigue plan, just know that you won't win." Demolished <laughs> him. Demolished him. <laughs> Not close. And so like like people just like think this was a, a joke and meme deck. The first few times I played it before I kind of got tournament results with it, um, they just like, "Oh, you're playing." healing bomb like what and i'm like yeah that's like the best card in my deck um and and so like there was a lot of people like brushing it off as like oh this is like a meme joke deck but like i kept winning with it so i knew there was something there despite you know what my opponents kind of laughed at me for <laughs> that's amazing that's amazing and there must be like a, there's such a, a cool thing where you, when you find something out mm-hmm. when you end up figuring out a deck and you're like oh like that is a that is a really rare feeling that not a lot of players have gotten uh, mm-hmm. So I'm sure that that's very validating for you as like a deck builder, an innovator, yeah. like someone who's playing the game. Like that's really cool. Yeah, it um, definitely is. Um, so I have a big question for you, but because we're on the topic of fatigue and all that, um, I wanted to. There's something that we wanted to touch on a bit later, but um, you obviously played Michael Hamilton. Uh, mm-hmm. You you know twice, you guys have... actually twice. <laughs> yeah, once in Swiss, I beat him wow. there and then lost to him in the finals. Ah, uh, I mean. That number one, that's a great, that's an amazing achievement. Like, you know, how many players can say they've beaten Michael Hamilton? Not many. <laughs> or how many can say they played him twice in the same event? Like, oh, once in Swiss and again in the finals. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, like, I like, uh, I, I think Flesh and Blood is so interesting, and and the way that you see it with, you know, don't play the now, play the later. You know, play mm-hmm. turn 16 to 25, don't play yeah. turn 1 to 12 or, or, you know, that kind of mentality. I experienced that with Prism, and it's like, you know, sometimes you'd pitch uh, a really valuable aura, and then you'd be like, yeah, because eventually I'll find it back, and then you're just dead, right? Yeah. Um, but there's also some decks that that play on the building a board, building a presence, uh, and I personally think that those decks tend to outvalue a lot of other decks over time if they're able to stay alive while building value. Decks like Dash, decks like Prism was, Dromai to a certain extent, although she's very weak to Phantasm. Um, Icelander uh, is certainly, if you look at the little thing there, Icelander is, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, so... What do you think about those decks? Because that is kind of one way to outvalue your te- your plan of going the second cycle. Yeah. Yeah, so when I was initially building this deck, um, I played it at one local just to get, get a feel for it, and I didn't have Imperial Warhorn in it. And I, I lost to an Icelander who did the Icelander combo thing. And I'm like, hmm, this is tough. And so I was starting running math, like, well, if I can gain this much life, and then their combo does this much. And, and like... The math just wasn't quite there. And then I realized Imperial Warhorn was a thing. <laughs> and then and then I got excited about the deck. And then I'm like, okay, this deck is actually, I broke the meta with this one. Um, but yeah, those kinds of decks are very good conceptually to keep this kind of thing in check because I really don't present 
uh, very much threat turn to turn. Like best I can do, well, I can pulverize on occasion, which is great. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, I like if you do nothing and just like play an item or play an aura, um, my turn is you know swing hammer or like maybe attack for six or eight uh, with a blue attack. And so uh, those decks that can kind of progress their game plan without directly engaging in in an a, attack on the combat chain, then uh, you know, that's a good way of attacking these decks. And, and I think those are good to exist in the metagame. Um, that being said, I don't think they're very powerful right now um, because of Warhorn and because of Remembrance. The combination of that uh, means that you can often disrupt um, Dash pretty well, uh, at least to the point of you probably force a draw. <laughs> Yeah. Um, because both of like, like at pistol dash versus fatigue oldham, like really it's two fatigue decks against each other and it just takes a long time. They can attack you a bunch, but if you destroy one or two items, you don't really leak too many points of damage. And that game just goes on a very long time because both players just can't kill them very quickly. So what I'm hearing is mm -hmm. people should be buying play sets of remembrance. <laughs> I think remembrance is, <laughs> uh, is quite good with, uh, when combined with Warhorn, because it overcomes the the core downside, and it also it's a very good answer to Warhorn because it can put the cards that Warhorn destroys back in your deck. So, uh, yeah. in this particular situation, yes, Remembrance is very good. <laughs> so <laughs> there's hot one take ban sorry. Warhorn. Yeah, or sorry, no, yeah, hot this... take hot take ban Remembrance. Yeah, you hot take ban Remembrance. So the you've said, like there the word Warhorn has been said so many times in the last minute. Yeah. Um, and there's something that I know a lot of players want to know. I mm -hmm. want to know. I kind of know because we kind of, you know, <laughs> but like I I know a lot of people want to know. Dude, where was the Warhorn? <laughs> yeah, so in the finals, I died without ever seeing my Imperial Warhorn. Um, so I think ultimately it was when I conceded, it was the fourth card down. So it would have come in the next hand. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know exactly if it was the bottom card or it, among the bottom cards, but it, it was pretty close to the bottom of my deck when when it was shuffled and cut at the start. Um, but so funny story about that. So um, uh, I played, like I said earlier, I played Michael Hamilton twice. Once in Swiss, where I beat him, and the the strategy he employed that game. He knew what I was on. He had watched my games because my games went close to time. He knew what was up. Um, his strategy was first cycle was he was just pitching the uh, Frost Texas. So he he literally pitch stacked him. He coronet peaked himself multiple times um, just to be able to pitch cards. Um, and then second cycle, he set up a situation where, you know, at the end of my turn, he played a Frost Tex. And then on his turn, he played a Frost Tex and then Arsenal, the third one to play on my turn again. So like all three came out real fast. And so I had Warhorn sitting in play. I was ready for it. And so as soon as he did that, I destroyed the first one, but then he played the third. And so he kind of gave me no time to cast my Remembrance and shuffle it back in and find it again, as if um, if he had just played them out, you know, kind of one at a time as soon as he found them. Um, and my deck runs to Remembrance. So I ended up like the Warhorn was in play and I just draw the Remembrance. I'm like, well, I haven't even popped the Warhorn yet. So this is bad. Um, so going into the rematch in, in the finals, um, I kind of switched up my sideboarding ever so slightly. I kept in one extra sink, sink below because he's going to be making physical attacks. And I sided out one Remembrance because I thought uh, he's going to do that same kind of thing where he's going to try to late cycle, bring these in, and my Remembrances aren't going to be that great. Um, so with that backdrop, I've got, I know I have one Remembrance in my deck, and I actually draw it fairly early, like turn three or four. And so I'm like, okay, I'll just stick it in my arsenal, uh, leave it there when I find the Warhorn you know, I'll, I'll be able to shuffle back right away. Um, and so that's why for the first, you know, like five or 10 turns of the game, you don't see me actually uh, use my, uh, cycle away my arsenal with the Crown of Seeds because there's a Remembrance sitting in there and I know it's my only one. So I send, if I send it to the bottom, it's not coming back in time to destroy a second Frost X. Um, and so that kind of compounded the problem because I wasn't going through five cards per turn. Sometimes I was holding multiples and I was only drawing like two cards at the end of turn, which means it's just harder and harder to find that Warhorn. Um, that combined with the fact that Hamilton switched up his strategy and just played all his Frost Texas as soon as he found them uh, left me in a very awkward situation where, like, I'm holding this Remembrance and I can't really send it to the bottom because I only have one and my Warhorn is not showing up. And so it was kind of a, you know, a combination of, of bad bad situations um, that, that led to that, uh, to the way that game played out. Yeah, and you know, I I watched that game so intensely, and I like I had this thing where I was like my heart was like pounding in my chest watching you play because I'm like, 
<laughs> you got it, you know? Uh, <laughs> and and there was like that turn um, where he got the, fir- the third Frost Hex. And it was like, there was a two point cycle where he got the third Frost Hex out. And then he had a hand where it was like, um, I, I can't remember what the exact play, you probably remember, but it was it was like a Scarfus car into uh, a big block. You had to dump three cards. And then you were left with one card, and then he ice Etern- He uh, like pocketed an ice eternal and blasted you. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, I was looking at that play. I'm just like, there's like that is, like the timing on that, is is insane. And like, <laughs> give the guy credit. Like, I'm sure yeah. it was there was some some thought behind it. But like, the timing on that was just, and and that's like my heart kind of sank because on that first hit, you took something like 16 damage. Yeah. You know, and I'm looking at that play, and I, and I saw, and I, I was hurt because I saw, like, I saw you play, and I that's when you went, sh- like, your face changed for, yeah. like, the first time. That's and when I, I knew that, oh, this game is is not yeah. going to be like every other game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I and that sinking feeling, like, I could recognize it, like, I, I've experienced it a couple times, and I'm just like... Mm-hmm. And then I was, I was kind of, I sat back and I looked, at, I looked at, I, you know, the game finished and you like, you props it. And then on that final turn where you, he ice eternaled again, mm-hmm. like you, you crowned and then you, you put it under and you found a, a yeah. red, like a sink below, which did nothing. And I was just like, oh, that is a really unfortunate like way to end the game. And then you, you know, props him and, and all that. And, you know, you still made it out well, like you, you, you know, you made some money, you got some, like, sure, sure. it was a good weekend for Charles yes. Dunn, you know, like, <laughs> it was. was good. But at the um, time... Didn't feel very good. <laughs> that's Absolutely, so and that's yeah, and that's valid too. Mm-hmm. I think like that's that is um that is such a, a like a statement of like professional card game players. It's like it wasn't first, so it wasn't good enough. And it's like, yeah. dude, you finished <laughs> second, like you, like you, undefeated up until <laughs> fighting the freaking world yeah. champion. Did have one draw, but yes, yeah. Yeah. I mean, undefeated. A draw I, did is not not lose, I did not have a loss, correct. A draw is not a loss. <laughs> I've, yes. been, I've gone 0 3 on Olden before. I didn't win a single <laughs> game, okay? Sure. Uh, and I think that that's, that's really um, like watching the game and like being very invested and, and you know, invested in the player, invested in the meta. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a sucker for Prism. She's no longer with us. <laughs> uh, and, and looking at the meta right now, I'm, like, I'm just like, Ice is it. And, and you're, I think, the final was was really the two boogeymen. Mm-hmm. I think there's no uh, there's no other way to look at the fab meta right now um, than old and my slander. And then you're like, oh, I'll draw my. I'm like, eh, draw my. Um, but like, those are the two decks. And outside of that, is there any like, are you changing decks anytime soon? <laughs> um, probably not until uh, until out. Outsiders comes out. Uh, of course, that could change everything. Uh, a brand new set, um, giving a lot of support to assassins, so that might be a thing, um, as well as um, ninja and ranger. Um, but in the foreseeable future, if, if I do play in any of the uh, the other like battle hardens between now and Outsiders, I I'd be hard pressed to change. I, I do think it attacks the game uh, or attacks the meta on a, on a fundamentally powerful axis that uh, the current card pool just really doesn't have a great way of of attacking, um, partially because the relative strength of of aggressive decks is just kind of low compared to where it has historically been. You know, you think of things like um, like Briar with Ball Lightning and Plunder Run. Uh, and Plunder Run or or Starbo oh or Chain. <laughs> yeah, could, yeah. I mean, these are like really powerful decks that could do a lot of damage in kind of uninteractive ways, whether it be Dominate or just like. You know, having a seven extra cards that chain draws, or or whatever the thing is, or Prism was obviously much more powerful what she did than what than compared to Dromai and what she does right now. Um, and so I think the general power level of the game has gone down um, to a point where you know just the fundamental rate of just blocking for three with all of your cards is kind of too good right now, and and there's nothing that kind of goes over the top enough to to really dethrone it and make me uh, want to try something else at the moment. That's really that's really interesting, and especially you know I think that one of the things that I, my takeaways from what you just said is that um, aggro is not in a place right now where it can contest. Right. And and to like um and that's like a, a weird sentiment because a lot of people would say oh no I play fly and fly is great well, well belittle you I, know hurts the deck. I but. think belittle but the other issue with aggro though is is aggro is for so many people the preferred way to play the, the yes. game on a progress on a proactive mm. strategy and. 
there there's so many variables as to why that becomes an issue but one of the big key ones being then when you play into a field where everybody else is on that same mentality as you the agro mirror is such a coin flip that um yeah. a lot of you know i, I know at indy the, the big thing is a lot of agro players eliminated themselves and whereas a, a strategy like yours in that field uh, charles does so much better because you just attack the meta so well yeah and, and, there's yeah. something to be said for the consistency of this style of deck as opposed to aggro like you could play briar and briar might be the best deck but it it'll sometimes just draw all non-attack hands and then mm -hmm. doesn't matter mm -hmm. if you're you know the best player in the world or somebody just picked it up for the first time like you're gonna have a bad time if you draw all non-attacks two turns in a row if you break you break Absolutely. So out of all the things we were talking, I, I think what the most interesting part of your strategy is that, and this is something that I come, I look at from a, 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 a like a, as a player that played Dorinthia and as a player who played uh, a lot of Prism, is your deck doesn't only give you an advantage in its consistency and in your mastery of the deck. It also challenges the opponent in a way that they have to try and outvalue you consistently. And decks that put pressure on the opponent to make the right decisions tend to give the the player a, a, a you know a player who, who's very um uh disciplined again i'm using dis discipline is the word of the day kids <laughs> sure. but like a player who's very disciplined it gives you such a massive advantage yeah uh, the number of times throughout um indie that my opponent like I, I won the game and my opponent said oh man i i made a mistake on this turn and that and that really hurt me it's like it was very high because they had to play a lot of turns they had to remember their pitch stack they had to keep a lot of things in the mind and these were these were very good players who like had tech in against me like there was a briar um a briar player i beat matt dilks on the first day very high rated yeah. uh, player and, and player. he had like three red evergreens like he was ready for this wow. and there's you know one turn where he just kind of stumbled he maybe missed up i don't know if he like put his pitch in the wrong order or something he just had um had, had the wrong combination of cards and just couldn't you know, couldn't execute his strategy as well as he'd like in that endgame. And that gave me an opening to cast Pulverize when he's low on cards. And then, you know, um, I took over from there. Um, same against uh, uh, Chris Ayali, played later on. He was on Lexi and he had a hyper teched version. Like he had uh, two Remembrance in Lexi. I think he presented 71 cards. He had two last ditch effort. Like he was ready to fatigue. Wow. And uh, I think he said near the end of the game, he he blocked with the wrong card, didn't let him make the attack that he wanted to make. and you know, once again, kind of fell apart right there at the end because they have to be the ones making that hard decision for 55 minutes in a row. I can just block with any of my blues because they're all the same card to me. Right? And uh, so there's there's definitely something to be said for putting the pressure on your opponent to make those tough decisions, um, especially if they're not something that they are super practiced and prepared to do. I like that a lot. I, I, I like your take on that. And like, I have this weird idea that Olden, like if we were to play like flesh and blood with a, a chess clock, mm -hmm. I think you'd probably have like five minutes on the clock. Oh yeah. And then you're probably <laughs> like 45 minutes of just like painstaking, like brain numbing thinking. Well, yeah. Talishar does offer that feature even like you get to see the match time and how long yeah. you spent deciding. And I'm sure when that I was, was probably... Talishar. Yeah, uh, exactly. Pretty frequently my opponent would have twice as much time on their clock as I did. That's crazy. Uh, um, yeah. And um, I, I, this is like, I'm, I'm so impressed. Uh, I'm impressed by you. I think you're an impressive player, and I think you've put so much work in. And um, anybody that you know can, can you know, beat the world champion in Swiss, and then go to the finals, and then you know, have the run that you had. Um, you know, I've met you. We've played and stuff. And like, I'm not a, I'm not a, a pro tour winning player, but like, I'm no schlub. And mm -hmm. like playing against you, every time we've played, it was always very engaging. And like, I just, I'm, I'm really impressed. And one of the things that I'd like to know, because you just like me, you have 15 plus years of experience in playing competitive card games. Um, what are like, this, and this, you could take your time, we can cut it in post afterwards. Uh, but what are three tips that you would give to anybody that's trying to get better at card games? Yeah. Uh... So there's a lot of things uh, to think about uh, when looking at getting better at card games. I, I guess first is just to uh, really like understand what your deck is trying to do and why you're trying to do it. Um, oftentimes, if it's a newer player, you're just gonna like your friend's gonna hand your deck and say, you know, just go and play it. Just just do what you think is right. And um, 
the kind of the first step to getting better is kind of understanding what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, you should kind of be able to articulate like what is the value proposition if you're using kind of like um, you know businessy words like like why does this deck exist? Why isn't it something else? Um, and so for you know a fatigue deck, it's very easy to answer. It's like well, it's because you you want to do this kind of um, blocking and defensive thing, but I find sometimes it gets a lot harder when you are comparing a bunch of aggro decks against each other. It's like, why play Briar versus play Viscerai versus play, um, you know, boost dash or something. And so if, if you really want to kind of take your game to the next level, you should be able to have a, a very coherent answer to like, why are you playing this deck as opposed to anything else? Like, what is your game plan and why, like, why did you build your deck that way? Um, I guess if it coming up with other, um, other tips. <laughs> I put you on the spot too much. It's okay. No, no, no. That this was is, a great tip. Cool. Um, I, I think the second one is to, if possible, uh, try to have someone else watching your games and and telling you where and when you mess up. Um, my good friend Pat Eschke, I've been playing um, with him for, uh, well, playing card games with him forever, but Flesh and Blood kind of since the start. And very frequently we're watching each other's games, whether it be at ProQuest or Armories or um, War and Testing Online. And and there's a very healthy dynamic there of just constantly pointing out mistakes um, or constantly pointing out like questionable lines. Like, hey, why did you decide to do this? Um, and just having that that somebody else to constantly be questioning you and, and forcing you to reevaluate. Um, I mean, even at Indy in the top eight, like I walked away from my top four match and the first thing Pat said to me is like, hey, why did you do this one thing that one turn? Like he didn't even say congrats. He's just like, why did you do this? <laughs> and so like I had to explain it to him and and it it made sense. But if it didn't make sense, then you know, that questioning is very important to to force you to um come to, to terms with what may be in your blind spot and identify opportunities for improvement. Very cool. So um I was gonna press you for a third tip, but those are two great <laughs> tips. Uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> essentially like um yeah, I like that idea of just you know having buddies, having friends, someone that can watch your game and say, question your your line of, of thinking and and not only that, but learning from your mistakes. Like the, I think the worst thing that you could do as a player is walking in and be like, I played that perfect. Yeah. No, yeah. like <laughs> I, I'm I'm also super critical of myself, right? Like I I actually um, in one of my Swiss games against a Dash player where it actually went to time because we were both, you know, trying to fatigue each other. Um, I walked away from that like, man, I, I played that horribly. I missed a tunic trigger here. I, I you know, I blocked with the wrong card. I, I did, you know, X, Y, Z. And my friend's like, man, you played that really well. I'm like, no, I didn't. But, you know, from, from the outside, like, <laughs> you also have to be your own own worst critic um, on kind of holding yourself accountable to like, you know, always look for opportunities where you can improve even if no one else sees them. That's a that's your third tip. Sure. <laughs> that's your third tip. That's a great third tip. Uh, I'll let I'll let Adam go into the next uh, segment. That was great. Yeah, and actually, yeah, to that point, uh, Charles, I that's a big thing that I think I credit to my progress in this game has been giving myself the permission to look back on every single match I play, like every single. Obviously, like there, you have your times where you're just playing loose and it's for fun and whatever. But in every single meaningful match, every single tight match being able to look back and go even the ones that went well look back and go what could i have done better what can i take away from this and yeah like, i think that's a huge thing that if players can give themselves the permission to do that that's uh going to be a huge uh a huge room for growth and leveling up uh moving uh we're rounding the bases here we're getting near the end um we uh sean and i charles we wanted to quickly touch on um let, let's let's have some fun and do some some outsider specking what are let's start with sure. you charles what are what are your hopes what are you excited about what do you what, yeah what's got so, you so far yeah i'm i'm obviously excited for assassins um whenever they announced in dynasty that assassin would be the new class um my first thought is like well, I'm just gonna, you know, play Assassins from now on because it's the newest class. It's obviously gonna be broken. Um, turns out that wasn't exactly the case with Arachne. Uh, it turns out he did not quite have enough support and was not as as broken as we thought he might be. But now that he's getting uh, a full set of support as well as, um, you know, another uh, Assassin hero as well, um, I have really high hopes that it's gonna be able to, you know, kind of be disruptive as a brand new class added to the game, especially because the direction it looks like they've been taking it from uh from the the dynasty content is you know really punishing blocking whether that be through spiders bites or 
um, or the attack reactions. And so hopefully that's a way to kind of punch through a lot of these fatigue decks or the, the more defensive decks um, with these kind of more, um, more offensively focused cards. Uh, so definitely excited for that. I've been known to dabble in in some rangers from here and the, uh, not now and again, and so uh, seeing more support for them always is gonna make me happy. Um, although I think one of them is like focused on traps. I think they said for yeah, Riptide. Rip, Riptide, yeah, he's trap based, <laughs> which he <laughs> oh, starts oh, at lower oh, life. So, oh boy, do I have opinions? Traps, traps, maybe. Uh, I, I think traps as they are currently in the game are not very well designed. I, I, th I think they're just. They they take all the the clunkiness of playing a defense reaction in general because you can only use it while defending and also requiring it to be in the arsenal is just kind of a non-starter. But I'm very curious to see if they give him some way to kind of uh, make that more consistently viable as a as a strategy. I think um, so. I'll just throw my little thing here, uh, not mm -hmm. to take That's away your from, from uh, your spotlight. <laughs> but so um, I. Number one, when you say you have a little bit of ranger on your heart, is that a, is that a little azalea tattoo right here? Or, or <laughs> no, like, no, I, I've I've dabbled quite a bit with Lexi. Uh, okay. uh, in fact, uh, you know, the the first battle heart in that I won in Philadelphia, like literally the night before, I was going to play a Lexi deck. Um, it was like a go tall death dealer Lexi. Like it was actually pretty yeah. legit. I love um, that deck. Oh yeah, but, that's but we had Lexi the Starvo too. deck, and I'm like, no, the Starvo deck is just too good. I got to swap, and it and it was too good. But it, it I was, was really close to playing a Lexi deck at that tournament. Um, I I just I, I think she's really cool, but yeah, it does suffer from the level of inconsistency that Rangers do have. I mean, weapons are strong. Uh, like the cool <laughs> thing, the one thing that I really like about that Lexi Death Dealer build was like we're talking about this, like the Storm Strider on hit, right? And that's Storm Strider, uh, Shock Charmers on hit. Oh yeah, Shock Charmers yeah, and yeah. Blizzard yeah. Bolts yeah. and and Weave Ice and. All of it, yeah. I, that deck was so cool. I remember <laughs> losing to that like, on, on like Red Lion Briar and being like, what? Like, oh yeah, what? demolishes those kind of decks. But oh, it was brutal. It was brutal. It was <laughs> guys ever on the receiving hand of Ball Lightning, Ball Lightning, Shock Charmers, Shock Charmers. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. yep. <laughs> uh so with all that like um with with outsiders coming up i the heroes don't really speak to me but i i was looking at like i'm like there's there's room for them to make riptide kind of an instant uh instant trap kind of kind of hero and mm -hmm. you know make him extremely interactive because you're right like the traps that exist right now tripwire and whatever like it's kind of eh. you know it's it's no one really like i don't get excited about those cards Right. But I do get excited about the prospect of, you know, being able to uh, have a class that's very interactive, uh, a lot of instants, but not in the same way that's like, oh, instant, you lose more like instant, maybe rethink your turn. Uh, so I, I think that that's why I, I'm excited for Riptide. Ninja's cool. Katsu getting more like the Katsu discord was going wild after that card. <laughs> Like it was just. I mean, just, Bonds is everybody... Bonds is spicy though. Like, don't get me wrong. It's a tutorable tutor that that. A tutor. <laughs> that discounts itself and gives go again and interacts with it, it like the fact that it's a, a it specifically says a card with gust wave that leaves the us to believe that we're going to get a whole cycle of gust waves like we're not just going to have whelming gust wave where i mean there's yeah, the meme direction overwhelming gust wave yeah i was gonna say that, gust wave that's the and... meme direction of yeah. it but i'm sure yeah, it's gonna be great. like who knows like tempest gust wave or sure. electric gust wave i don't know like there's so many directions being that elemental ninja what shadow ninja i want shadow ninja but that that's that's projecting way down the future. Uh, yeah. Katsu does not have elements, but Bonds is spicy. I think that is that makes me wonder what else we're getting for for Ninja. I'm excited for that. Uh, like out of all of that, and out of Outsiders coming out, and um, you mentioned Assassin, and I, I think classes that have really strong on hits, kind of like Ice Lexi in a way. Um, I think that is a really cool way to check um, decks that are trying to stop you or, or, you know, disable your play. Um, and you're right. Arachne doesn't have the tools to do it right. There's one player who found a way to win like two pro quests on it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but outside of that, um, I do think that like LSS historically has been releasing, you know, new decks and stuff with ideas to either counter itself or create a format that's playable within itself, but typically their releases and whatever they're bringing out has a way to interact with whatever's existing. So who knows, maybe they were like, we we saw we saw the future. We knew Charles Dunn was going to play that deck. 
you know, Indianapolis. And what's going to beat it is this new, you know, assassin build. Um, in in your heart, like in your mind's eye, or in your like heart of hearts, um, what's the one thing that you'd like to see? If there's one card or one equipment for a hero that you like or a class you like, if there's one thing that you you're like, this could exist. Mm -hmm. and could find its way into outsiders what do you think that would be considering you know multi-class cards and all that is mm -hmm. there did you think about that before is there something you already have uh, like not particularly um let's think i think one of the things that uh what we i guess we still don't know what the stealth mechanic does in for for assassins so i kind of have high hopes for that i hope it is something along the lines of like can't be blocked by defense reactions mm -hmm. um that like if that is the mechanic that just gives them kind of like you know that ton of counterplay um against the kind of decks that that i think are, are going to be a scourge of the metagame going forward um so yeah i guess i guess maybe it's more i hope that's what the mechanic is um or, or something <laughs> that, that kind of punishes blocking christmas because... wish list yeah yeah so I have a, uh, we have a running pool on that. Uh, we're trying to figure out what it could be. Mm -hmm. uh, my take is that if played from Arsenal, it's uh, it, it's it cannot be blocked by more than one card, or cannot be blocked by like it's if played from Arsenal, cannot be X. Okay, interesting. That's yeah, I hadn't considered that. I know the the one for six um, can only be played from Arsenal, basically, or it can't be played from hand. So that yeah, yeah that might be it. That's my hot take. I, don't know. I mean, definitely, like, rest assured, it's, it's, I think we can all agree it's probably some form of evasion of all things. Like, yeah. oh, can't yeah, be blocked from hand, can't be blocked from arsenal, blocking, yeah. some dominate, yeah. some, something that, like, in, and we've seen, dare we mention the game that thou, sh thou shall not be named Magic. <laughs> um, like, we've seen so many different flavors of evasion where it's menace or it's, um, fear. Um, yeah, fear. I, don't, I haven't played in yeah. a while. I, like all the different mechanics escape my mind. We've seen so many different plays on it. And Azalea, the cool thing about like Azalea is she plays on a few different iterations of it. You know, between Remorseless, Release the Tension, um, she has Dominate. Like she can manipulate it in a few different ways. And if you know, it would make sense that Assassin also kind of gets that ability. Like they can. It, like thematically an assassin has the tools and the ability to stalk their prey and choose the right tools for the right situation and if over time we see assassin get maybe stealth and maybe a few other things that give it you can't uh block from hand you can't block from arsenal you can't use a defense reaction you can't use an attack action mm -hmm. who knows like that could be a really cool design space uh, over time for assassin Man, Azalea, flip the card from the top of your deck, put it in your arsenal, gets dominate, has stealth, can't be blocked by more than one card or defense reactions. <laughs> That's just a laundry <laughs> list of all the things you can't do against this card. It's like, it's just going to hit. And when that <laughs> card that's just going to hit is something like Red in the Ledger or Remorseless. Yeah, like, or Remorseless. Yeah, I love Remorseless. This can be a pretty big game. Yeah. Some Regicide awesome. Ultimate Win Con can't win the game. Uh, I don't know. Sure. Uh, I, hot take. I will end on this. Um, Azalea is not bad. Azalea is misunderstood. Um, I think Ranger as a <laughs> whole is a just isn't misunderstood is a a a class that targets metas that doesn't play into an open meta. Anyway. Um, we won't dive into that hot take though, because that could uh, lead us off for who knows what other kind of Aggress. conversations. Yeah, we could. Yeah, <laughs> tangents are definitely a possible. Uh, we're gonna round the bases and wrap up here. Uh, I want to thank uh, both uh, Charles Dunn. And I also want to quickly mention, Sean, uh, I know we breezed over your introduction quickly. Uh, listeners, over time, you will get the chance to get to know Sean. Uh, we wanted to stick to the, the heart of uh featuring charles in this episode because um charles has been ripping up the scene and making a name for himself and uh he is somebody to keep your eye on moving forward in in in, in the pro fab scene Let, let's be honest it's a pro scene at this point Ch charles you're a pro you've definitely made a name for yourself um quickly do you have any shout outs any anything you want to plug this is your opportunity uh, yeah, just shout out to uh, my friends who helped me test this deck, uh, Pat Eschke, Devin Rateni, um, Gary Gold, who traveled with me to the event, and my wider team, uh, the Eye of the Storm, um, 
they all helped me to prepare the deck, and uh, I couldn't convince a lot of them to play this deck because they didn't want to go full fatigue, but uh, they definitely <laughs> helped me in kind of iterating and, and making sure it was uh, tuned for the meta, even if uh, they were too scared to play it themselves. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I, I, I love that this game brings everybody together, and I love the shout-outs to your buddies. Like that, I think that that's the most beautiful thing about card games. Co community is definitely a, a huge factor from this game. I know it's what keeps me coming back, and it just further breathes the argument that Flesh and Blood is a team sport, and, uh, you know, like, we compete individually, but, uh, you know, teams are what or what um, sculpts success in this game. Uh, I want to quickly shout out uh, us, of course. Uh, we are the combat chain. Uh, I am Adam Phillip, Chuck Fong, Tulery. You got Sean Hill. Uh, Sean Hill. Sean Hill's new chief. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Hill's new G on yeah. Twitter. so we are, we, yeah, of course, we are uh, the plugs. We are uh, on... Uh, on YouTube at uh, at the Combat Chain, uh, you can find us on all uh, major podcast platforms. We're retooling some things. Sean and I are looking at the drawing board, and on we're we're going to be doing some video content here, and uh, you can you can find that on YouTube. Uh, on Twitter, uh, you can find us at the Combat Chain. You can find me at Fomtulery TCG, and you can find Sean Hill at Sean Hill CG, and. Uh, we i'm gonna address quickly there was we did have a patreon um that is on pause currently thank you so much to everybody who did support us there in the meantime uh we've got a couple dollars in the reserve we're going to use them strategically um we are going to retool some things there see figure out what works for us but we also do want to bring just some we want to do some cool stuff for you guys like um i, I of course like i've been at this for over a year i uh the, the this is a passion project for me uh and you know i sean is new to the combat chain but sean and i have been talking a lot behind the scenes and i know he's uh he's got some devoted interest in, in doing some cool stuff so uh over time like you know thank you for everybody who who has listened to us thus far and uh, who who's sticking it out with us uh, i hope to bring you guys some really cool stuff moving forward and just just keep your eyes your ears, eyes, whatever you use to absorb information peeled. And uh, we're going to be bringing some cool stuff soon. Uh, now we have one last piece of business before we wrap things up. Uh, Charles, you may not be aware of this. Um, we wrap up the show in a very particular way. It has gone through, uh, through the, the history of this show. I'm going to gush a little bit just because this is our first episode with Sean and uh over the the history of uh, of the show, we've done this in uh, one particular way where the host, the person guiding the show says, I'm until next week. And then we all in unison say we're we're closing the combat chain and it's incredibly cheesy and it's incredibly campy. And it's it's so much fun because it never comes out perfectly. And we're doing a new recording technique, so I can't even fix the lining up of this in the post production. So we are 100 <laughs> percent stuck to whatever happens here. And that's the beauty Perfect. of it. Uh, it's just a it. fun, a fun little way to, to just tip the to put the icing on the cake so um that's it for this week uh thanks again to charles dunn uh thanks to sean hill for coming along on this journey with me uh we have a lot of cool stuff coming forward in the future and uh until next week we're we are closing, closing the combat, the combat chain. Chain. <laughs> that was beautiful i think that was actually I, that sounded smooth to me we'll see what it sounds like in post production